Good evening, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Donaldson. I am the curator for the Lorraine Historical Society. Thank you all for joining us this evening for our first History from Home program this year. Uh, March is Women's History Month, and so we are featuring a relatively unknown woman from Lorraine, Ruth Anna Fisher. Before I introduce our speaker, I do have a few announcements. Um, first of all, if you are joining us this evening, then you know that this program today is free for everyone. Um, the Lorraine Historical Society reopened in March and we are eager to welcome you back in person. If you are interested in supporting the museum during this time, please consider becoming a member, renewing your membership early or making a donation. Any support is appreciated. Um, our next History at Home program will feature another Lorrainite, General Quincy Adams Gilmore, which will be a presentation on his life and accomplishments in commemoration of the 160th anniversary of the Civil War. That program will be April 20th at 7 p.m. And now on to tonight's program. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat or question feature at the bottom um, and I'll share our questions with the speaker at the end. So uh, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, Katrina Walker. She is the former Ohio History Service Corps member and a graduate of Sarah Lawrence College. She's currently pursuing her master's in arts management at American University and hopes to use her love of history and public engagement in a career in museums. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Katrina. Good evening. Um, I am so pleased um, to have been asked to join you all this evening to share a little bit of my research um, into Lorrainite Ruth Anna Fisher. So while I was serving with AmeriCorps and I was hosted by the Oberlin Heritage Center last year, one of my smaller projects was a mini, ex mini exhibit, excuse me, on African American female educators of the 19th century. It was during this research that I first encountered a mention of Fisher while the timeline of her life fell outside the scope of my research, I was intrigued by this Oberlin graduate who had gone on to study in London, something I myself was considering at the time. Through snippets of research using only what I have had available through the Oberlin Heritage Center, the Oberlin College Archives, and of course, the Lorraine Historical Society, as well as scrolling to the very end of the Google results page, I have begun to sort of piece together this portrait of, of this remarkable woman, a woman who was, you know, not content to make her mark in one place or one area, um, who had really been kind of consigned to the footnotes of history. So, and as I hope you will see in tonight's presentation, there is still so much left to be uncovered and so much that will have to remain in the past um, of the life of Ruth Anna Fisher. So Ruth Anna Fisher was born in Lorraine, Ohio in 1886. Her father, David Crockett Fisher, who most often went by the initials DC, had been born in West Virginia, but made his way to Northeast Ohio to study at the Oberlin Preparatory Department and is listed as a student there in 1868. From Oberlin, he made his way to Lorraine, appearing in the census as living in, in a boarding house of James Porter in Lorraine in 1880. In 1883, he married Elizabeth Dorsey Brown in Lorraine. Elizabeth, who also went by Libby, was the daughter of a soldier who died in the Civil War and his widow from Ashland, Ohio. D.C. was a highly profitable business, businessman for the time in a number of industries, most notably in ice and real estate, beginning his ice business in 1881 and continuing it through at least the mid-1890s. His, his uh, business is described in an 1892 edition of the Cleveland Gazette as Lorraine's leading dealer in Lake Ice. There's a, in 18, 1891, um, there is a fire and actually two of the ice houses burned down, but by the next year, um, you can see that he's rebuilt. His real estate firm was what 
was what contributed to the bulk of the family's financial success, however, with one biographic profile of him explaining that at one time he owned nine properties within Lorraine. Um, his real estate was behind the Citizen Savings Bank building on Broadway in the heart of downtown. He was active in the community, both as a member of the Board of Health and in local Republican politics, at one point even running for office. He is also mentioned as being the president of the Colored Political Association of Lorraine County in 1910 in the Cleveland Gazette. A contemporary of Fisher's who wrote, most, who wrote the most comprehensive account of her life that was available the year after her death writes that while Ruth Anna Fisher did not discuss her childhood often. It is, quote, known that she was so devoted to her father that little affection seemed left for her mother and brother. So clearly a very close relationship between father and daughter. The colleague at the Library of Congress, Sylvia Lyons Render, also writes that Ruth Anna would also accompany to her, young, her father to political meetings at a young age. And she credits this with her early, with an early development of awareness of the social and political issues of the day. The family lived in a series of homes in the fashionable part of the downtown Lorraine area throughout the 1880s through the 1920 census, after which there is no record. They attended the Congregational Church, which is notable since there were at least three other African-American churches in Lorraine at the time they attended, but they chose the predominantly white progressive church. Ruth Anna and her brother, Arthur Edwin, who was born in 1884, both attended the Lorraine public schools. Arthur would later attend the Oberlin Conservatory of Music, graduating the same year as Ruth. Mentions of DC and Ruth Anna appear regularly in the Cleveland Gazette, the major Cleveland African-American newspaper. And the Fisher family appears to have been very close with the editor, Henry, Harry Clay Smith. Their social life accomplishments and comings and goings from the office of the Cleveland Gazette are noted most consistently from the late 1880s through the end of World War I. A notable occurrence during this time period that's um, highlighted in the Cleveland Gazette as well as in local Illyria, the local Illyria paper was a incident um, that caused DC Fisher to bring a lawsuit against an Illyria restaurant after he was refused service because of the color of his skin. Um, I believe it was a $500 lawsuit. Ruth Anna attended Oberlin College from about 18, from about 1903 to 1906. While at Oberlin, Fisher lived in Talcott Hall, was a member of the Ladies Literary Society, and took co courses both in the college and the conservatory. Fisher was a gifted soloist and performed bo both at Oberlin at a few performances recorded later by the Cleveland Gazette and later pursued more musical training in Canada and England. According to the Oberlin reviews of the, her time at Oberlin, she would often return home to nearby Lorraine on weekends. After graduation from Oberlin, Ruth Anna was invited to teach at Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. However, she remains only for a few months. She is dismissed after allegedly having a disagreement at the, over the school's insistence that she teach Sunday school. This is particularly peculiar to me as she was a lifelong member of her, the Congregationalist Church in Lorraine. Notably, family friend and the editor of the Cleveland Gazette was a critic of vocational colleges like Tuskegee and typically advocated for readers of his paper to attend liberal arts colleges instead it seems much more likely that the disagreement came about due to a difference in pedagogy. She does expound more on this later in some of her correspondence that has survived, taking, clearly taking issue with Booker T. Washington's overall, overall philosophy about education and promotion of African-American causes. After this dismissal, she returns to Lorraine. Over the next decade and a half, Fisher teaches in Lorraine, Indianapolis, West Virginia, and Virginia, 
arts and studies at the Canadian Academy of Music, presumably during her work as a stenographer for a law firm in, in Toronto. Through these years, she appears intimate, intermittently in social activism, speaking out against the screening of an offensive racist film that was being screened in Lorraine and attaching her name to an article advocating for birth control in 1916. She's also noted to have attended a suffrage convention in Columbus in 1917. In 1918, DC Fisher passes away apparently unexpected, according to a letter from the W.E.B. Du Bois collection in 1918. He is buried in Lorraine at Elmwood Cemetery. It is perhaps this that prompts Ruth Anna to pursue a change of scenery. And as far as I can tell, she never again lives in the Northeast Ohio region after this point. At the end of World War I and into 1919, Fisher has taken charge of a YWCA in Harlem, New York. In 1920, when a benefactor offers to pay for a year of study abroad to continue, to continue Fisher's education, she accepts and enrolls in classes at the London School of Economics. This is a photo, one of the only really good photos we have of Ruth Anna Fisher that is not, it really is the only good Photo we have a Ruth and official that is not connected um, to her either high school or college schooling. So this is the photo from her 1920 passport application. While abroad in London, Fisher was advised to meet with historian and one of the founders of the American Historical Association, J. Franklin Jameson. Jameson interviews Ruth and thus begins a partnership that will last till Jameson's death in 1937. He enlists her help with his work as director of the Carnegie Institution. And when he moves over to become the chief of the manuscripts division of the Library of Congress, Ruth is brought along as an assistant, but remains in London. She works on locating documents in the British Museum and the British Parliament Public Records Office. And she has claimed, she claims to be the first foreigner to be given a key to the British Museum and the first woman. Jameson is an ardent supporter of Fisher, once positively, a bet somewhat patronizingly describing her to a fellow historian as having the quote, proper delicacy about the color line, but highly intelligent and educated Negroes have so hard a pathway in America. I want her to have what pleasure she can in Europe end quote. He raises funds to, for her to pursue her passions outside of history as well. She even trains as an opera singer in London between 1931 and 1932, but her musical aspirations are cut short by an operation. It is unclear from my research who exactly referred Ruth to Jameson and thus changed the trajectory of her career and her life but it doesn't seem outlandish to suppose that it was W.E.B. Du Bois, the influential African-American sociologist and historian and a founder of the NAACP. Although we cannot be sure exactly of how she and Du Bois first became acquainted, it is presumably through her father, who was in contact with Du Bois regarding the Niagara Movement, a precursor to the NAACP, prior to 1909, and she is listed as being among those who hosted him for a lecture in Oberlin in 1910. A 1914 mention of her in the Cleveland Gazette further links her to Dubois as having visited the offices of the Gazette with him during a highly successful visit to Cleveland. A collection of letters between W.E.B. Dubois provide, and Fisher provides an illuminating look at a professional and friendly correspondence that lasts for over five decades. From the surviving letters that exist from 1909 to 1961, they carry on a correspondence that waxes and wanes, discussing the mundane to the consequential. Reoccurring topics include the most pressing political issues of the day, plans for the second and third Pan-African conferences held in Europe, and their own historical research, as well as her work as a contributing editor to the Phylon magazine, 
of which Dubois was the editor in chief. Their shared affinity for sparkling conversation is evident. She, at one point in one letter, she rebukes Dubois teasingly, really on more than one occasion for writing letters that she deems too short. And her sense of humor shines through when she is asked to describe herself in the 1930s for a possible profile to be published in his magazine as quote, a stout middle-aged woman, hopefully not too much so, end quote. And then writes something that is pretty illegible about how her white Persian cat qualifies her for spinsterhood. Fisher never marries. She is listed as a delegate in 1921 for the second Pan-African Con Congress in London. She appears to have a, had a very busy and packed life in abroad. The Render article describes her as having an illustrious social circle in London with a number of intellectuals and writers of the, the day being linked to Fisher in this article, including H.G. Wells and Langston Hughes. She travels widely abroad, visiting France, Italy, Egypt, and more, which I thought seemed rather apt for a woman from the international city of Lorraine. She remains in London with a few apparent trips back to the States for conferences and visits until 1940. Even after Britain has declared war, Fisher remains. This is one of the letters from the W.E.B. Dubois collection, which is held by the Amherst College Library and Archives. Um, this is one of my favorite letters that's in the collection. I love um, the way at the end she's talking about, it starts, her, you know, she's really talking about the work she's doing and she goes on to talk about current events, which is really living through the blitz in London. Um, so she, towards the end, um, quote, it is an odd feeling to be under the constant threat of bombardment. And it looks very much as if the threat would become a reality before this letter reaches you. Are we downhearted? No. Sincerely yours, Ruth Anna Fisher. From what I can infer from the dates of the of following letters, um, it, it very well could have been the next day or the next couple of days um, that her apartment was bombed and all of her possessions including her original diploma from Oberlin and many other papers were destroyed in the bombing. Her first few letters then from Washington DC indicate that she is relying on the W on the YWCA having presumably either resumed or stayed in contact with the organization since her days running the World War I organization in Harlem. After she settles in DC, she lives most of her time here in the neighborhood surrounding Howard University in the Northeast quadrant of the city. In her wartime letters with Dubois, she describes her life as incredibly busy with the wartime 48 hour work week being a particular strain with her commute. Being a current resident of Washington DC, I can attest that the neighborhood Fisher is in and the Library of Congress would be quite a commute. And um, of course, Ruth Anna Fisher didn't have Uber. Beyond this, she finds Washington DC a world away from her life in London and compares the inequality she witnesses here to the rise of nationalism in Germany in, in an incredibly prescient way. Quote, I hate Washington with an intense hatred. I see no difference here between the Japanese and Prussian military caste and the Southern oligarchy here. They are all convinced of their race superiority and they control the army and Navy. The Ku Klux Klan is like the stormtroopers and all of these groups want to make their opinions the predominant and powerful ones in their respective countries and the world with all else subservient to them. It further seems as likely for a Hitler to arise here in these circumstances as in Germany." End quote. She certainly devotes a lot of ink and paper in her letters throughout the 1940s, not only to the war effort, her work for the Library of Congress and current events, but also trying to get back to London. Later when she does get back, um, the letters still revolve around current events and her work, but um, 
with the war being over, there are some luxuries allowed. She writes, um, she's, she's happy, thrilled to be back and she writes that she felt she had never left. Although she does request of Dubois on his next visit to London, could he please bring her some American hair products and a blouse? After she completes the project, she is sent back to London in 1949 to finish. She returns to DC in 1952. From the start of her career in history, she regularly appears in many of the major African-American scholarly history publications of the day, as well as having her work appear in the American Historical Review until the late 60s. Her scholarly output primarily revolves around the documents she was charged with copying in London that were concerning the late 18th century slave trade. And she is mentioned in the acknowledgements for numerous scholarly articles of the time that deal with this topic as being an invaluable resource who is able to unearth the most obscure things. She continues to work for the Library of Congress, preparing the guides for numerous manuscripts that she copied abroad. She writes a biographical article with colleagues on her mentor, Jameson, that is published in 1952. She retires from the Library of Congress in March of 1956. A contemporary official from the Library of Congress described her in an article in the year after her death as having a passion for music, literature and languages, especially Latin, politics, sparkling conversation, cats, and gourmet cooking. After her retirement, she took classes at George Washington University to refresh her Latin. In this same article written by the Library of Congress contemporary, the writer asserts that while Fisher did not generally participate in public protesting, she felt it her duty at age 77 to participate in the historic March on Washington in 1963, where Martin Luther King delivers his I Have a Dream speech. Whether she felt it her duty as an African-American woman, as a historian, or both, is unclear. The same author also writes that, quote, although she never overtly called attention to her ethnic identity, she had a pride for her Afro-American background, a pride that required no touting. She simply refused to let race or any other artificially imposed distinction impinge upon her being Ruth Anna Fisher person. The author writes that, quote, the general acceptance of her on her own merits as an Afro-American in Great Britain, both before and after World War II, could hardly have been paralleled in this country until the 1960s, if then. I would argue that the opportunity to, to prove herself abroad as colleagues from the Library of Congress would later describe her, um, quote, marvelous scholar and, quote, a woman of the greatest dignity of anyone I have ever known, end quote, away from the evident prejudices that she would have faced attempting to pursue that same career in the United States really cannot be overstated. She died in 1975 with an obituary published in the Washington Post. To my knowledge, there are no public monuments or plaques documenting her life. She left behind no heirs, but left her money to the family's congregational church in Lorraine, the Universalist Memorial Chapel in DC, and Oberlin College, to which she also left her personal library. She was praised for her ability to find the most obscure documents. So I hope she might find the humor in my research into her work and life coming from a very obscure range of documents and places. Since the bulk of my research on Ruth Anna Fisher has been done primarily over the last year during the COVID-19 pandemic, I have, it has been primarily digital. I truly look forward to the reopening of many libraries and archives. And while the article written just after her death mentions that the bulk of her papers prior to 1940 were lost to the blitz and a significant amount were apparently discarded after her death. There are some apparently on record in the Library of Congress, although of course not digitized. And I 
sincerely hope perhaps in a file in an archive somewhere left to be discovered there is more on Ruth and a Fisher left to be discovered by another enterprising archivist. Thank you so much for attending this evening. It is truly always a pleasure for me to discuss Fisher and her work. And I hope that I've been able to illuminate a little bit more about this inspiring and intrepid Lorrainite. Thank you, Katrina. Um... Uh, that was wonderful. Um, everyone, if you have questions, um, please feel free to use the chat feature. Um, but while we wait for some questions to come in, Katrina, I have one for you. Um, so, of, I mean, her, she has such an eventful life and it seems like she experienced so many different parts of American society and history. But what do you think is makes the, of her journey or her personality, her experience that's most relevant to today? What part of her life mm -hmm. would you say? I think something that stands out to me as probably being the most relevant is her sort of the culture shock coming from um, somewhere like Lorraine and the Congregational Church and Oberlin that are progressive um, predominantly white spaces where she was able to have a little bit more, um, I don't think she was as confined as, and I think there was some culture shock going to the Tuskegee Institute, teaching in the South. Um, there's a letter in the W.B. Du Bois collection where she says that she'll never go back to the South until she can drive herself. Um, and I'm sure there's a story there. Um, and I, I'm really fascinated with Washington DC really being, you know, a major, a major, Af uh, you know, African American city in the United States. I'm really interested in her perception of it um, in the 1960s. Um, and I'm, I'm really, I find it really interesting that she is so drawn towards London and towards places where, um, where she can have a little bit more freedom. And that's what she grew up with. That's what she was familiar with. That's what she's, you know, she's raised with. And then I think she goes out into the, the wider world uh, uh, away from Northeast Ohio, where she'd been sort of in this little, a little bit of a bubble. And I think there's a little bit of culture shock there. And I think that that's something that's still un unfortunately really, really true that there are pockets, there are bubbles. Um, and when you go outside of those, there's a little bit of culture shock and there's a little bit of sort of okay, where's my place in all of this? Um, and I think that really that's true for anyone, but I think particularly for, um, for people of color and especially for women of color. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that. Um, we have a, a question or a comment and question here from Carl Jacobson. He says, I hope Katrina will be able to put together a bio on her that can be shared with the Oberlin Heritage Center. Um, Lorraine Historical and perhaps, and perhaps the Oberlin Alumni Magazine. Um, I wonder why she has not received very much attention. Carl, I ask that same question all the time and the really simple answer and Caitlin and I were just talking about this this afternoon is she really was really obscure. Um, this sort of kind of snowballed from, from my research project um, on African American educators who were female educators who graduated from Oberlin in the 19th century. She's kind of at the tail end of an article I was reading. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wanna learn more about this. And I started to dig a little bit deeper. And um, in, in the research, I came across the Render article, the, the article written by her colleague at the Library of Congress. And there was a little mention about the Universalist Memorial Chapel. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's kind of an outlier. Um, I'm gonna contact them. So I thought maybe there was a connection with the Universal's Memorial Chapel and her participation in the March on Washington. Maybe there's a connection there. I contacted them and um, their church historian was so interested that she took it on herself over a long weekend. She pretty much wrote the bulk of the Wikipedia article on Ruth Anna Fisher that didn't exist until January, 2020. So until January, 2020, there's not a lot out there on the internet about her. 
now I was I was doing some fact checking, double checking last night, and I type in Ruthanna Fisher, and everything about this event comes up. So you know, I think she's we're starting to kind of get it out there. We're starting to kind of be uncovered, and I think. Um, you know, unfortunately, with so much of her papers, so many of her papers and her belongings being lost or discarded, um, I think that really has contributed to sort of her erasure. And as I kind of, as I said, she's kind of in the footnotes of history. So it's sort of teasing that out and teasing out what we can and what's left. Um, and I, I hope there's some letters or some, I'd love for there to be another picture, but I hope there's at least some more of the W.B. Du Bois letters. Um, I'm really curious how some of the letters from W.B. Du Bois to Ruth Anna Fisher while she's in London get to, to that archive. There's a story there and uh, I'm not done, I'm not done with my research and I'm going to figure out <laughs> how those got there or at least a little bit more than I can tease out. So I don't think, I don't think she's going to remain as anonymous for a long, not if I have anything to say about it anyway. Um, another question was, is from Brenda Norton. She says, was the church she left part of her estate to the first congregational church on Washington Avenue? And that's true. The picture we had in the presentation is the church prior to the tornado. So it looks, um, it's a whole different building now for those um, who are familiar with Lorraine's churches. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, Caitlin, that would have been the church that she and her family attended correct. in the photograph. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And if, well, her father passed away in 1918. Mm -hmm. If her mother continued to go there, then she would have, after the tornado, gone to the one that's currently standing. There wasn't a good place to slip this into the presentation, but I, I do think her mother was still in Lorraine. If the date's not wrong on, on a letter in the collection, um, in 1935, she writes to Dubois asking if he can please get in contact with her family's pastor to try to get information about her mother who has said that she needs to leave Lorraine urgently. And I don't know the story behind that. Um, she may have been in poor health. Um, she would have been getting older at this point, um, but clearly there was still, on her death, she, she writes a lot about financial troubles in her later years to Dubois. Um, so clearly there is still an affinity for the three places that she left, um, her estate to. Um, so clearly the congregational church was one of those places. Um, and Brenda followed up. She said that that church merged into the Amherst UCC, which she belongs to, and they may have some records. I'll drop, I'll drop my email in the comments. <laughs> Any, any little, any little snippet I can get, um, it really, it kind of is coming from all kinds of places. And um, the more I, the more I tease out, the more avenues I have to explore. Um, and I, I plan once things are reopening here in DC to go be a pest um, to any place that might have any record um, of her. So yes, please, if, if they would have anything, um, that would be fantastic. Awesome. Um, well, I don't have any um, additional questions in yet. Um, so we'll hang out here for a couple more minutes. Um, I got a comment here. Excellent presentation. Love your enthusiasm. Impeccable research. You leave no stone unturned. Only the ones that are buried. <laughs> Only the ones that are buried. And I, that's another thing is I don't know where she's, I don't know where Ruth Ada Fisher was buried. That's another one of those mysteries I still have yet to, or her mother, I have yet to figure either of those out. Um, once the weather gets a little bit nicer here in DC, I might, I might go do some, some, some wandering, see if I can track down. <laughs> uh, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. It seems like an odd uh, weekend activity, but clearly, um, you know, in the quest for research about Ruthina Fisher, I will, I'll figure it out. <laughs> We, we love and appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> um, well, thanks everyone who um, attended tonight. We'll be here for a couple more minutes if more questions come in, but, um, oh, someone asked, are you going to write a book? Oh, I don't <laughs> think I know who asked that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll see. Um, 
let's let's see what else I can find out once COVID is over. We'll see what else is out there. I'm not sure if there's quite enough for a book just yet. At least not one without a lot of, I'd have to invent a lot at this point. <laughs> there's still a lot of gaps in the, in the record. All right. Well, um, thanks again, Katrina. Um, Thank you. Wonderful having you. Um, everyone, we are recording this, so we'll have the recording um, available. Um, if you'd like to see it, just let me know. Um, and everyone have a wonderful evening.